Hi, everybody. So now we are going to prove in stages one of the major theorems that we're going to deal with in this course. It's uh, what's called the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. And uh, like all fundamental theorems, uh, it's very fundamental. So what does it say? Uh, well, it says that if you have a finite abelian group, uh, then you're isomorphic to a product of cyclic groups of prime power order. So this is a very powerful classification theorem, which tells you that any finite abelian group can be expressed by taking sim simple objects, they're not simple groups, but namely cyclic groups of prime power order, and then taking their Cartesian product to put them together. And up to isomorphism, that explains every finite abelian group. So for example, suppose you know that you have a group G, which is a finite abelian and has 100 elements. And by the fundamental theorem, you know that G has to be a product G1 cross G2 cross G3 cross Gn, where each Gi is cyclic of prime power order. But you know a lot more than that because you know that if the order of Gi is pi to the ki, so it's some prime power uh, where i is 1 up to n. These, these are prime numbers. pi is prime, but they might some of these primes might be the same. Then you know that if you multiply the orders of these things together, the product of pi to the ki, i goes from 1 to n, that has to be the order of g because in a Cartesian product, the order of a Cartesian product of finite things is the product of the orders, and this is 100. So in how many ways can you write 100 as a product of prime powers? Well, you can write 100 as 2 times 2 times 5 times 5, or you can write it as 2 squared times 5 times 5, or you can write it as 2 times 2 times 5 squared, or you can write it as 2 squared times 5 squared. And to each of these factorizations, you have a corresponding factorization, a possible factorization of the group. Namely, your group G could be Z2 cross Z2 cross Z5 cross Z5. Or it could be Z4 cross Z5 cross Z5. Or it could be Z2 cross Z2 cross Z25, or it could be Z4 cross Z25. And um, those are the only possible ways that you can write a product of cyclic groups of prime power order, whose orders multiply up to 100. So there's only, at most, four um, different finite abelian groups with 100 elements. Similarly, if, G, if you know that G has order 27, then G has to be a product. So 27 is 3 cubed. And if you're going to write uh, 27 as a product of prime powers, it's either 3 times 3 times 3, or 3 times 3 squared, or 3 cubed. So your group is either Z3 cross Z3 cross Z3, or Z3 cross Z9, or Z27. That is to say, it's either cyclic of order 27, or it has a cyclic subgroup of order 3 and a cyclic subgroup of order 9, and it's the product of those two, or it's the product of three cyclic groups, each of order 3. So this uh, fundamental theorem tells you that the problem of finding all possible abelian groups of a given order is basically reduces to the problem of factoring the order into prime powers and figuring out how many different ways you can do that. And then there's a second part of the problem, which is deciding uh, if any of if these are different from one another, so um, that's uh, sort of a separate thing to talk about. So I won't worry about that right now because instead I want to give you a way to do this that accounts for the fact that sometimes when you do these decompositions you get the same an answer. I'm not going to actually prove this result just in the interest of time. I, I assign it as a homework problem. So let but. Um, here's what it says. This is a somewhat more efficient way to phrase 
the, um, the previous uh, result, but in such a way that you actually can enumerate isomorphism classes of groups. And what it says is that to give an isomorphism class of a finite abelian group with a given order, you have to find a sequence of numbers, d1, d2, and so forth, each dividing the next, and whose product is n, where n is the order. And then once you have these di's, your group G is a product of cyclic groups of order d1, d2, dk. Now, these groups are all cyclic, but they're not of prime power order necessarily, so that's a disadvantage from the previous one. But the advantage is that if you have two different sequences, the resulting groups are isomor not isomorphic, and that is an improvement over the preceding result. So let's look at the case of 108. 108 is 27 times 4, so it's 3 cubed times 2 squared. If you don't believe me, multiply 4 times 27 and see what you get. So how are we going to make a sequence like this? Well, one sequence is to just take the number 108. And in that case, and maybe I should say here, the di's are all supposed to be bigger than 1. So if you just have 108, then you're, this is the cyclic group of order 108, and that's one possible isomorphism class. The next thing you can do is you can take the sequence 2 and 54, and that corresponds to the groups Z2 mod C, Z54. Now, you can't pull another 2 out of the 54, because what would be left would be 27, so you can't have 4 divides 27. But you can do 3, and it divides 9, 3 squared times 2 squared, 9 times 4 is 36, 3 times 36 is 108, and that corresponds to the group Z3 cross Z36. And you can pull another 3 out of there, so you would have 9 divides, um, sorry, you can't pull another 3 out of there, because then you'd have 9, but you'd only have 3 left. But you can pull a 2 out of there, and you can get 6 divides 18, which uh, is another, and 6 times 18 is still 108, so you have Z6 cross Z18. And um, what else can you do? Well, you can do three, you have three threes to work with. So you can do three divides three divides 12, which is nine times 12, which is 108. So that's the case Z3 cross Z3 cross Z12. And, but you can't pull another three out of the 12 uh, because you'd be left just with, um, with an even number here, so that's no good. And um, what about the case where you then have 3 divides 6 divides 6? So I pulled the 2 out of the 12, and that's a, an OK sequence. So I have Z3 cross Z6 cross Z6, which is 36 times 3 is 108. And I don't think I can go any farther, because if I pull anything out of the 6 and put it in the 3, then I'm going to be in trouble here. And um, if I have two 2s, then I'm going to use up all the 2s, and what's left is only going to have a 3. So I think this are, these are the possibilities. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 possibilities. And those are all of the uh, classes of groups of order 108. How is this related to the preceding thing? Well, if you look back, I mean, if we just did it the other way, we would, we would, for instance, have groups like Z3 cross Z3 cross Z3 cross Z2 cross Z2. But Z3 cross Z2 is Z6. So you could group these like this, and you would get Z3 cross Z6 cross Z6. And that would be the same as this, so that would be on our list. And you could have Z9 cross Z2 cross Z2. That would have been on our list. Uh, sorry, cross Z3. We need another 3. But Z9 cross Z2 is Z18, and Z2 cross Z3 is Z6. So that would have also been counted on our list, and so on. So the, strat the, the relationship between these two results is that you... Um, 
you look at the prime power orders and then you, you group together different primes, you can combine those because if you have a product of two groups with abelian groups with relatively prime orders, then the result, if you have a cyclic group of order P and a cyclic group of order Q and P and Q are different, then you get a cyclic group of order PQ. And just to do one more example, maybe I should have done this one first, 81 is three to the fourth. So you can have the sequence three divides three divides three divides three, or you can have the sequence three divides three divides nine, or you can have the sequence three divides 27, or you can have the sequence 81. So these correspond to the group Z3 cross Z. Oh, and also you can have the sequence nine divides nine. So you can have Z3 cross Z3 cross Z3 cross Z3, Z3 cross Z3 cross Z9, Z9 cross Z9, Z3 cross Z27, and Z81. And those are the possible um, subgroups of uh, cyclic abelian groups of order 81. So how are we going to prove this result? This is just an example of how you apply the result. How are we going to prove it? Well, as I said, it takes a certain amount of work, and there are four steps. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to prove something that has come up several times, which is we're going to prove a converse to Lagrange's theorem for abelian groups. Namely, we're going to prove that if you have an abelian group of order n and you have a prime divisor of it, then you have an element in that group of order p. So we already know from Lagrange's theorem that if we have an element of order p in a group, then since the order of the element divides the order of the group, the order of the, the, gr the group is divisible by p. Now we're going to prove the converse. We're going to prove that if we have a prime that divides the order of the group, then there's an element of, of that order. And um, we're going to do this in the abelian case, and then later we're going to prove that this is true even for non-abelian finite groups. But we're going to do this for abelian groups first. So let's now assume that we know that. We know that if p divides the order of a group, then there exists a g in g with order p. That's the hard part, because we already knew uh, the other way around. Now, um, now we're going to uh, look at groups in which every element of the group has prime power order. So there's, if you look at all the orders of the groups, they're all powers of a single prime. A group with that property is called, and we're going to assume, as always, that these groups are abelian and finite. So a group with that property is called a finite abelian P group, where P is the relevant prime. And we're going to show that if every element of a group, a finite abelian group, has order of the power of a particular prime, then the total number of elements in the group is a power of that prime. In other words, so it says, if every element of G has order of power of a fixed prime, then the number of elements in G is a power of P. And that's called a finite abelian P group. So this actually follows pretty easily from the preceding result. Because if you think about it, if, if the number of elements of G were not a power of P, then there would be another prime which divided it. And then there would have to be an element with that order. And therefore, every element of, you'd have a situation where that group doesn't have every element of power of P. So this step is pretty easy once we have the first part. Then maybe comes the hardest of the parts. We're gonna, we've now got the situation where we have a group which has prime power order, and it's abelian. And we're going to show that in such a case, that group is either cyclic, or we can find a cyclic P group. So we can write G as a cyclic, re, cyclic P group. So it's a cyclic group of power, prime power order times something else. And because this group has prime power order, and this group has prime power order, this group will have prime power order, but it will have fewer elements. And then we can recursively apply this, and the result will be to show that if you have a finite abelian P group, then by doing this over and over again, such a group is a product of cyclic P groups. And then finally, we're going to do something which we've 
actually more or less done before, which is that if we have an abelian group which has order n times m, where n and m have no factor in common, then you can take inside G all the elements whose order divides n and all the elements whose order divides m. Those are subgroups, and it turns out that G is actually the internal direct product of those two subgroups. So these are the four lemmas that we need to prove the, fin the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. How are they used? Well, you start with an abelian group of order n, and you factor it into um, factor n into a product of distinct primes. And then you use part four, which says that if you um, apply part four recursively, you can take your group G and you can split it up into the elements of order pow whose order is a power of the first prime and a second one, the elements whose order is powers of the second prime and so on, where each thing here, these are the, the G and G such that the order of G is a power of PI. And since these primes are distinct, any, you, any splitting like this, you'll get um, things with the two factors will have greatest common divisor one, and then you can split those factors and those factors and those factors. And what this tells you is that your group is a product of abelian P groups. Then you use the result three, which says that if you have an abelian P group, it's a product of cyclic P groups. So you can then take G P1 P I to the N I and write it as a product of a cyclic group P I to the S1 S K. So here the primes are all the same, but your abelian P group is written as a product of cyclic abelian P groups, cyclic P groups. And when you put these together, you see that your group first decomposes as a product of P groups, and then each P group as a product of cyclic groups. And when you put all that together, you have your group as a product of cyclic P groups. So um, as I said, this is going to take some work. The proof is in the book, but because it's um, fairly, I guess, a little bit technical, I'm going to walk through following the uh, proof in the book very closely in the next couple of videos.